So we are going to revisit or hearken back to the tabernacle that we've been sharing out for several weeks. It was our plan to be able to wrap everything up here in the month of January, um, unless the Lord has a different plan for that. And then in February, we're going to be looking at Love Is. So I'm excited for that series as well. But I wanted just to uh, kind of walk us through where we are and, and remind us about the tabernacle. So Anthony said this morning, I appreciate you being um, sensitive to what the Spirit is saying this morning, so I appreciate that. But as you walk past, when we first enter into the outer court of the tabernacle, we are first faced with that brazen altar, which there are a thousand ways to die, but only one way to the throne of God. And that is right here. The sacrifice that it represents that was made once and for all for us. Then when we go beyond that, then we have the brazen labor, which we spent a great deal of time and sharing on. And we've had several people that have been baptized since then, which is fantastic. I do want to tell you, if you did not get baptized either the first or the second week, but the Lord is still tugging on your heart to do so, you don't have to wait for us to announce that we're having a special service. If we have to open up the baptismal waters every week, I will do that. Okay, there's enough people that still want to be circumcised. <laughs> we can do that. So it's not a hassle. It's not a problem. Just give us a heads up by, you know, we need to have a conversation to make sure there's understanding and see if you have any questions. But we need to know 100% for sure by Thursday because we've got to make sure the tank is clean. You don't want to be going there with all dust. Sometimes there might be spiders. Sorry, Megan. There was maybe a half dozen spiders the week that we opened it up for you. We didn't tell you that because you wouldn't have got in there, but there was just so you know. <laughs> we can tell you now. You know you're never more than seven feet away from a spider at any point in your life. <laughs> the brazen labor, water baptism, if you want to be baptized, let us know. And then we walk through and we enter into the holy place. And here is where we have spent the last couple weeks and we'll be spending the, all of our time today. But I do want to remind you as we walk in, and as you go through the outer court, it's called a gate. And when you walk in through into the holy place, there is a door. And directly in front of you is a veil. But we look to our left and we see the illumination. The room, once again, has a covering, so the only light is the golden candlestick that burns brightly, that's tended to twice daily, making sure that it never goes out and the oil is, is refilled, the Holy Spirit. And the wicks are trimmed, making sure that we are continually being filled with the Spirit. Being born again and water baptized and filled with the Spirit, it is an essential, essential part of your walk with the Lord. So important. If you weren't able to be here and you want to hear more about that, I would encourage you. The great thing is we have all of these in the series, so you can go back. So I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I did want to remind us as we walk into the holy place, we feel the warmth of that candlestick illuminating. And you know how what they look like they... They kind of flicker, and sometimes it gets a little darker than other times, and you see it there. And You look to your right, and there's the table of showbread. It has the 12 loaves representing the Word of God. I saw something this morning. It said that we're to treat our, the Word of the Lord as our daily bread. We've heard that expression. So many times we treat it as cake something that we do periodically, but it is our daily sustenance. We are getting to, into his word on a daily, Lord, speak to me. We say, sure, but when I read, I really want to, I really want, want to make a difference this year. And I really want 2022 to be new and it's fresh in the year, and I, I really want to read in the scripture, but it just, the, the words just swim around and 
and things don't really speak to me the way I hear other people. I'm, you know, I hear other people sharing things. I'm like, how did you ever even see that or hear that? It's right here. The illumination of the Holy Spirit is the only light. It's the only thing that gives light in this place. Then you turn and you smell something. See, when you come into the holy place, it's only a 10 by 10 room, so the light doesn't, doesn't need to be a ton, a, a huge, the candelabra, as it were, the, the candlestick does not need to be a huge thing, but it still is, is not super bright. And you can see the shadows that it casts on the wall over here with the, with the table of showbread, but then you turn and you smell something. You know, smell as the, the greatest attachment of memory in your smell. You smell the smell of walking into a home, you smell the smell of bleach. That means it's Saturday and all the windows are up and the sheets are put in, on a pile on the floor because all the sheets just got changed. And the bathroom just got cleaned with bleach and I love it. But anytime I smell bleach, immediately, of course, I'm 14 because that's when I remember everything. I'm 14 in my parents' home. And all, like I said, all, it's extra light that day because all the windows are open and, and you can hear the, the rainbow vacuum <laughs> with the water thing. That little thing is so weird. You have to dump it out. It's nasty. But you walk in and you can smell something that's coming from here. This is the, what's called the altar of incense. And it wasn't a candle that was lit behind it. You're going to have to use a little bit of imagination. But there was incense that was burning perpetually from this altar. And it was very strategically placed. It wasn't on accident. The Lord didn't just go, ah, roll a dice, put it there. But it went right here, right in front of the veil, so that the incense would waft into the most holy place. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 30. We're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures today. A majority of them we'll just quickly read on, on the screen just for the time's sake. But this one we'll actually turn to. It says Exodus chapter 30 starting in verse 1. And you shall make an altar to burn incense on and you shall make it of acacia wood. We've seen that many times now. Everything was made of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length, 18 inches. A cubit shall be its width, 18 inches. And it shall be a square. And two cubits shall be its height. Well, we actually have something that's built to scale this time. 18 by 18 and by 36. You shall overlay its top and its sides all around it, its horns. There's supposed to be some horns on there, but use your imagination. With pure gold. And you shall make it for molding of gold all around. Verse 4. Two gold rings shall you make it for it under the molding on both sides, and you shall place them under its sides. And then with the holders for the poles, we shall bear it. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I will meet with you. Aren't you gr grateful that he meets with us? Verse 7, Then Aaron shall burn on it sweet incense every morning when he tends the lamps, and he shall burn incense on it. Verse 8, And when Aaron lights the lamps the, at twilight, they shall burn incense on it, and perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations, and you shall not offer strained incense on it, or a burnt offering, or a grain offering, nor put any drink offering on it. All those offerings were for out here. There was one offering that was to be here, and that's it. And Aaron shall make atonement upon its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of the atonement. Once a year shall make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. It is most holy. So, what do we have here? Well, we have a rectangular box covered in gold. We know it's directly before the veil. We know what to do and what not to do here in this passage. 
Every morning and evening, we see that as the candlestick is tended to, the word of the Lord. We also know that to make sure that our incense, which represents our worship, was still burning. It was to burn perpetually. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, when everything was brought in right standing, the high priest would sprinkle blood from the sin offering on the horns of the altar of incense as before he went through the veil into the most holy place, which we will get to in coming weeks. The altar of incense was the second of the two altars in the tabernacle. We know first about the brazen altar where our sin was dealt. We talked about the fire. The golden altar represents prayer and our worship to the Lord. And notice it was, once again, something that was done daily. So let's talk about prayer. The benefits of prayer. First of all, it helps you to develop a relationship with the Lord. It's communication and communion. You have to water the garden of your relationships in order for them to grow. So many times we treat prayer as, I'm just going to give my needs list, my want list to the Lord and say, peace, I'm out. If you were to call your friend and say, hey, Lindsay, I need this, I need this, I need you to take my kids to school, I need you to go to the grocery store to pick up some milk for me and some eggs, um, and then I need you to come over and there's some laundry on the table, could you please fold that? Thanks a lot, have a good day. Um, depending on what your situation is, I'm sure Lindsay may do that once or twice, but this is a weekly thing, never offering any reciprocity, never offering, never saying, hey, how's it going, Lindsay? What's going on in your life? And we just, oh, another, the next week, oh, Lindsay, uh, this is what's going on, my mom, my this, my brother, my uh, 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 dump, 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 word vomit. Okay, got to go, hang up. Pretty soon, Lindsay's going to feel like this is a pretty one-sided relationship. But how many times is that how we treat prayer? Lord, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. Help me with this. I want this. Oh, heal this. All fine things. Peace, I'm out. Amen. And we take off and we don't sit around to wait on the Lord. We don't wait for the communion aspect. We have the communication, sort of, one-way communication down, but the communion is severely lacking, and yet we wonder why we're not hearing from God. I don't hear from Him ever. Well, my question is always, how long do you wait on Him? Water the garden of the relationships you want to see grow. Another benefit of prayer, it provides answers. We see in Matthew 7:7. Says, seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open unto you. Ask and it will be given unto you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open unto you. When we are spending time in prayer, we will receive the answers that we are looking for when we allow time for communion and communication. We see in 1 John 4, 8, what it does here in this passage, this verse, it says, helps us to gain understanding of the nature of God. Why? Here it is. He does not love, does not know God, for why? God is love. Prayer allows us to be able to understand His nature, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that next month in the series of Love Is. John 16, we see another benefit of prayer. It helps us find direction, because it says here, however, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell it, tell you things to come. He will guide you into all truth. He will help you find direction. Some of you are seeking God for direction. This job, not this job. This decision, not this decision. 
when we are seeking the Lord and spending time in prayer, He will lead you into all truth. What a better way to be able to walk through life and asking the Lord for His direction and just waiting as opposed to running off into something that we feel like is His direction and then finding out a couple months later that it was a train wreck and a mess. Now we've got to undo things. Now we've got to make another change. Now we do all these types of things. And if we would have waited, we could have avoided those issues. Wait on the Lord. Mark 14, 38. Benefit of prayer, he will help you avoid temptation. It says, watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You find yourself stumbling in a similar area very often. I would challenge you to say, how's your prayer life? Continuing on here in Galatians 5.16, it says, If you walk in the Spirit, then you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if you're spending time in prayer, seeking the Lord for direction, so that you don't fall into temptation, then when we're walking in the Spirit, we won't fulfill those lustful desires. We also know when we're faced with temptation, He always provides a way of escape. Grateful for that. In Romans 8, we see another benefit for praying. Verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For do not know what we shall pray as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. If you ever sit there and feel like, Lord, I don't even know what to pray. Now, I'll hearken back to, and this right here is talking about praying in the Spirit. We had a great conversation with uh, one of Kylie's friends about this. She's, I would ask you to, to uh, pray for her. What's her name? Bree? Jessie. Different one. Jessie is her name. She is a, a uh, very young Christian. Kylie went to high school with her. She's an engineering student up at Michigan Tech and just is hungry for the things of the Lord. We went to lunch afterwards, our, my family and, and she and Kylie, and, and she was just the entire time, it was just asking me questions about uh, the, walking in the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit, all these different types of things. It was so exciting to see this young 22-year-old girl, 23, whatever she is, just seeking the Lord and, and new Christian, just so hungry for that. So I would encourage you to remember her, Jesse, as the Lord continues to speak to her, that she would have people come into her life that would speak truth into her. But one of the things we talked about was this passage right here, that the, there are times when we go to pray, we don't even know what to say. Has anybody ever been there before? You're like, Lord, I want to pray about this situation, but I don't even know what it is, what words I could possibly say right now. Well, the great thing about it is the Spirit will give us utterance, it says with groanings which cannot be uttered, meaning that when we are praying in the Spirit, when you're, when you're filled with the Spirit, the, the Spirit, your Spirit man will rise up and the Holy Spirit will rise up in you and you will pray in the Spirit. Pray in tongues is also called that. And what you're doing, therefore, is being able to pray and get, the Lord is giving you utterance to say things that you don't even know in your, in your in intellect and in your vocabulary to be able to share. Pray in His will in your life. I've heard it said multiple times actually since we had our, our second baptismal service and, and I had the conversation with Mike Abbey and, and how he said if this is what the Lord has for me I want all of it. And I've heard three different people say that exact expression that are not related at all. If this is what the Lord has for me I want all of it. And each time that that person prayed that prayer the Lord met them right where they were. If this is what the Lord has, I want all of it. People that believe that the, uh, um, that the, the working of the Spirit and the, and the works of the Spirit and so forth, the giftings are, are not for today. That they ended when the book of Acts was, was closed. Are today saying, if this is what you have for me, I want all of it. And being filled with the Spirit right then. I mean, that's amazing. The Lord has shown Himself faithful to these people. So I would encourage you, people who believe that the giftings of the Spirit are for today, 
If you haven't been recently filled or you've never been filled before, then you say, Lord, you don't have to be here up in front of the service or in front of the church. You don't have to do that. You don't have to have pastor or myself lay hands on you. If you want to, we can do that. You can be sitting in your room like Daryl was in the basement, this basement bedroom and say, Lord, if this is what you have for me, I want all of it. And he was filled with the Spirit right there by himself. That's what's great about the Spirit. He's omni-everywhere present. Present everywhere. Another benefit of prayer, and, oh, I did that one, sorry. In Romans 8 here, we see that we are aligning our prayer with God's will. So important. In Luke 22, it allows us to be able to accept God's will. Sometimes we're praying for something, and there's three answers that we get. I told you this before. One answer is yes. One answer is no. And you know I like to rhyme. So the last one is slow. That just means not right now. It's not a hard no. I told my kids a thousand times. They asked me, can I do this? I don't know yet. If you have to have an answer right now, the answer is no. But if you can wait, it's maybe. Now, kids think maybe is automatically Yes. But they know that if I say, if you have to have an answer right now, what's coming next? They're like, okay, okay, wait, take your time. Take your time. I'll wait. Well, that's what we see here. This is accepting the will of the Lord in our lives, even when we don't necessarily think that that's the direction we want to go. But we know that he knows the end from the beginning. He knows the end of the path that he's taken us down, and what he has, this direction over here, is far better than what we think. This right over here is shiny. This looks like, oh yeah, this has to be what the will of God is. This opportunity, this job, this whatever it is, this person, this girl, this guy, this has to be the one. But the Lord has a perfect plan for us. So are you willing to accept the answer, yes, no, slow? Jesus said it in Luke 22. If it's your will, take this cup from me. We know this is where he was praying in Gethsemane. And if anybody knew what was coming, because this man in his show demonstration of weakness, take this cup from me. Is there any way that we can bring salvation to the world without me having to go through all of this? Because this man also had the, in this part, in this point in his life, probably was the he probably didn't really necessarily want to be omniscient because in his weakness of a man knowing what was coming, he knew those stripes that were going to be laid. But he also knew this was the way. Plan A. It says he was a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. So this lamb, let us, let us make man in our image. This one that was there who knew in the beginning that thousands of years later that he would go to the cross, he knew it all that time. He definitely knew it in that moment. And he said, not my will, but yours be done. If there's ever a time that somebody really had justification for wanting there to be a different way, it would have been in this moment. But prayer... We see Jesus praying here that he, even, that I've, what I've always jumped out to me in this is, look at the grammar of this sentence. Father, if it's your will, take this cup from me. Take this cup away from me. Semicolon. Nevertheless. It doesn't say that he waited 30 minutes. He had all kinds of different kinds. He didn't even turn on his salesmanship and say, well, here's the reasons why. But he says, immediately, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Prayer helps us accept the will of the Lord. Our final benefit of prayer we're going to bring about today is that it helps us become more like Jesus. We see in Scripture time and time again how he is always praying several times, whether privately or even publicly, depending on the situation. 
One of his most famous prayers in Luke 23, 34. Here he is. Hanging on the cross. It's already been beat. It's already had the crown of thorns rammed down on his head. The nails have already been driven. He feels the weight of all of the sin of every man on his shoulders. These people that are still saying to him, mocking him, and saying, if you really are the Christ, if you really are the Son of God, come on down. We'll believe this. We'll believe it right now. Prove it to us. And here in this moment, even during all of these things, he prays a prayer. In Luke 23, it says, Father, forgive them. They don't. They don't, they don't really know what they're doing. They don't, they don't understand the gravity of what they're doing. They don't really know who I am. See, Peter had that revelation. He says, who do you say that I am? These people didn't have an understanding. The Spirit hadn't revealed to them who he really was. They knew when the earth shook. <laughs> They knew then, but forgive them, for they don't know what they do. We're going to see later on that he is our advocate. And here he was, hanging on the cross, experiencing the most excruciating pain that any one individual could ever experience, yet here he is advocating for them, the very ones that hung him there. Be more like Jesus. Now, we've seen the benefits of prayer. I want to kind of detail for a moment here the dangers of prayerlessness. We use this passage already, but I do want to reuse it again in Mark 14, verse 38. It says, watch ye and pray lest ye fall into temptation. So the reverse of that is when we aren't praying, we are weaker when in temptation comes along. When we so you can look at this verse two ways, backwards and forwards. And the fact that when we pray, we'll be stronger when temptation comes. When we don't, we will be weaker. Philippians 4, verse 6. We had a deliverance service this year, one of my favorite of the year. And a good portion of people came forward when we talked about anxiety. So I want you to look at this verse. And that's something that you struggle with. For those of you that are here, even those that are at home, we want to encourage you to write this passage down. That is in Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. It says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. What is the dangers of not having a prayer life? It allows anxiety to rise up in your mind. We see, I believe it's in First Peter, resist the enemy and he has to flee. Here we see, be anxious for nothing. Why? What are we doing? We are praying and th giving thanksgiving. Let's look at these things here. Would you rather have peace over anxiety? Of course you would. Praying, giving thanks, bringing your concerns to the Lord. Supplication actually means seeking and asking. I also, just like we did with verse 38 of Mark 14, I wanted to play this verse backwards as well. 
What if we don't pray? Okay? So if we start at the end of 7 and work our way backwards, it says, by, so we're praying and so forth, we will, it will, we'll have, we'll guard our hearts and our minds. So therefore, our hearts and our minds will be exposed. We will lack understanding when situations arise and instead of having peace, we'll have anxiety in our hearts. By not making our requests known to the Lord, by not being grateful for the things we have, by not seeking and asking, and in everything, praying, so never praying, we will be anxious in everything. I wrote a note a number of years ago, I don't even know who said it, but it says, there is no fear in God. Hmm. The Lord isn't fearful. He is many things, but fearful is not one of them. So when you experience fear, anxiety, depression, these things that try to come and attack your mind to the point at times you can physically feel it, that is not of God. In James 4, 2, it says, We do not have, you lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. By living a prayerless life, we limit the hand of the Lord in our lives. Romans 8.34, we talked, just mentioned it in passing before, it says about him being our advocate. An advocate is like an attorney. So they go before. They speak on your behalf. So if you've ever had a traffic violation or anything, you typically won't need an attorney for that, but whatever it is, if you've had any a representation of an attorney, they will go and speak on your behalf. You give them, there's an, an expression, it's called power of attorney. So everything they say, are you hearing me? Everything they say is on your behalf. So we see here in Romans 8, it says, talking about Jesus, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So I want you to imagine the throne of God here. And the Lord is sitting on the throne. He's not shaken by anything that's going on in our nation or the world. He's sitting on his throne. Very few times it talks about in Scripture how Jesus stood up. One of which was Stephen. We've talked about that before. Beautiful picture of that. I believe he was honoring Stephen in his, in his actions. But we see the throne of the Lord. You always talk, see the Lord sitting on his throne. Now Jesus is at his right hand. Not from your perspective, but from mine. Because the right hand is the position of power. Yeah. So from your perspective, he'd technically be on the left, but it's on his right hand, meaning that he's right here. So I can just kind of see this picture of the advocate kind of leaning over and being like, hey, uh, this Doug guy, he, uh, you know, he, he's a good guy. Yeah, he, he, he fell this week, and, and uh, you know, but he has repented, genuinely repented. And because of the blood that has been spilled, my blood, we're, it's cleansed. He's cleansed, washed, made pure. He's our advocate, going before the Lord. He ever makes intercession. That's our next passage, I believe. Yes, Hebrews 7.25. It says, he, I love this, this expression here, therefore he also is able to save to the utmost those who come to God through him, what do you think he was talking about? One way. Since he always, this is a, my favorite part of this passage, he always lives to make intercession for them. The King James says he ever lives. It is, he lives to do it. It is his life goal. It is his purposing now to make intercession for us. He ever lives. It's not regretful, oh, I got to go and you messed up again. I got to go and do this. No, he ever lives to do it. He's our advocate. He's our intercessor. He intercedes on our behalf. When we repent, 
He says, because of my sacrifice, because of my blood, Father, forgive them, wash them, and make them whiter than snow, as if it never even happened. The stain of it, we know in the Old Testament that it was, the stain was still there. Even that pastor talked about in many cases, the parchment that they would wash, there was always a residue. But this is something that is buried in the sea of forgetfulness. It is gone, never to be returned. We say, Lord, here I am again. Forgive me. And he's like, what are you talking about? What do you mean again? When we truly repented and turned, not looking back longingly like Lot's wife, but when we've turned from that wicked way, he has washed it and made it clean, as if it's never even happened. The omniscient God chooses to not hold us accountable to those things anymore. There are people in your lives that have done things against you, and you remember it. It's not like you're like, what are you talking about? I don't remember what, you're, what it was. They hurt me, but I don't remember. What do you mean? No, but what you're doing is you, when you walk in forgiveness, you choose not to have that be, you're not going to hold them accountable for that any longer. You're choosing that it doesn't matter. I'm not going to be um, angry with you. I'm not going to have resentment towards you. I'm not going to hold a grudge. I'm choosing to let it go. And in that, you receive freedom. And that's what the Lord does. He chooses to not hold that against us. He's our intercessor. Now, we've laid the groundwork, talked about what this is, so it represents two things, prayer. The incense was burning perpetually and tended to every morning and evening. It represents our fragrant worship that ascends before the throne of God. The second aspect of this is worship, and we're going to look at two characteristics of worship. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 7, a beautiful picture. Last May, we shared a message on forgiven much, love much. And this is one of the stories that we looked at here. Luke chapter 7, verse 36, and it says, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, talking of Jesus. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears. And wiped them with the hair of her head. Now, in order for you to understand how this is even working, if we were to pull up to a table now and be sitting there like this, it's pretty hard for her to be standing behind you and washing your feet. They didn't use chairs. They would, on many occasions, they would lean on, on typically on their left arm if they were right-handed so they could eat. They would lean on their arm like this and lay down, and their feet would be behind them. And that's where the table is. The spread was out here, typically on the ground, or maybe a, a small, it was lifted up a little bit, but nowhere near the kind of tables that we have now. So here she was. You can imagine Jesus is laying down forward like this. The Pharisees are all around, and she's standing behind him the entire time. And it says that she began to weep. And she brought this fragrant oil with her. It wasn't like she just said, oh, uh, let me look at my purse to see what I got or anything. She brought it with him with the intention of doing exactly what she was going to do. And being in the presence of the Lord, it brought conviction in her heart. And the weight of the sin that she felt and the things that she had done doesn't really get into a bunch of detail of all these different things. But she began to weep, we see here in verse 38, and began to wipe wash his feet with her tears, and wipe them with the hair of her head. So she took her hair down, and she began to wipe his feet. And then she kissed them and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now, the remorse of her sinful lifestyle literally was pouring out on his feet. She would wipe them with her hair and anointed them with oil. And I want you to think about Whenever you go into the yard and you have sandals on, whether you're working in the yard or go for a walk or whatever it is, 
When you come in, and if you spend any significant amount of time, if you're walking through the grass or whatever it might be, when you come in, your feet are filthy and dusty. And this is the life that they lived all the time. They were constantly walking around in these open shoe sandals, as it were, and there wasn't concrete, there wasn't pavement, there wasn't uh, um, blacktop or anything like that. Everything was just dusty, and they were walking around. Imagine, think about where they are. In the Middle East, it's very arid, very dusty. So they're walking around, and they come to somebody's home, and typically they had the lowest of servants would greet them at the door, and they would have a basin of water, and they would wash their feet, and they'd wipe them off, and so forth, right? Jesus demonstrated this with the disciples when he washed their feet. But this didn't happen here. So he's laying at the table, and this woman starts doing these things. So let's continue reading here. Thirty-nine. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, "This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what matter of woman this is, who is touching him, for she is a sinner." I find this. I find this statement pretty interesting. If she's such a disgusting person, what's she doing in your house? If you know, you're saying, oh, well, Jesus is a prophet if he, he's supposed to know what's going on. Okay, let's just a sec, for assume for a second that he didn't know. He does. But let's just assume for a second he doesn't. You know, clearly, yet you still allowed her in your home. Yet you are casting judgment on Jesus for not being prophetic and seeing, who, seeing right into her life. Yeah. Interesting how we tend to throw these accusations at it and we fa- fail to look into the mirror. Verse 40, and Jesus answered and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Today, nowadays, we would say, especially in the workplace, are you opening some feedback? Because we said, Simon, you open some feedback right now? Feedback is a gift. Be open to it. So he says, so Simon replies to him, teacher, say it. Bring it. I got it. I'm ready. 41, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. And I love Jesus starts telling a story. He lets people come to their own determination. He never, I shouldn't say never, more often than not, Jesus doesn't answer people's questions directly. He starts telling stories. And then they're like, oh man, I look like an idiot right now. Watch what happens. A certain creditor who had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to pay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more. 43. Simon answered and says, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, Jesus replies, you have rightly judged. 44. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. 45. You gave me no kiss. You didn't greet me when I came in. But this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. I feel like every time I come home from work, this is exactly what happens. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Um, 46. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Fragrant worship. Therefore I say to her, say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. 49, those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And I love it when Jesus ignores people's dumb questions. And he said to the woman, your faith saved you. Go in peace. One of my goals for 2022 is to be more like Jesus. So if you ask me a question, if I perceive it dumb, I'm walking away. (laughs) 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 Sometimes you have thoughts that shouldn't come out your mouth. That's one of those. What she has done here is classified as fragrant 
worship. Let's look at some characteristics of fragrant worship. It is intimate. It is between you and the Lord. It is costly. It costs you something. It's not flippant. Huh. Worship. It's my favorite one. It can't be released unless the vessel is broken. You want to have fragrant worship to emanate from your heart? Be willing to be broken before the Lord. I was wanting to demonstrate that, and I was like, I'm going to get some clay pots. I'm going to put my glasses on. I'm going to smash them. That didn't make sense. Why did, Smashing pot doesn't release anything. So I literally Googled things that can't be used unless they're broken. And the number one thing was an egg, which is great. I actually thought about that even before I looked at it. I was like, eggs are not useful until they're broken. But I hate eggs, and they smell. And I didn't want eggs on my hands while I was up here speaking. So you can just, in your mind, imagine smashing eggs. <laughs> but fragrant worship cannot be released until the vessel is broken. Another aspect or characteristic of fragrant worship Hear this, it is not hindered by others. You don't care what other people think when you're pouring yourself out before the Lord. What are they doing? What are they thinking? Not your concern, not your interest. Once again, it is intimate between you and our Father. Another characteristic of fragrant worship is it places you in right relationship with the Lord. Restoration is the result of fragrant worship. But watch this. Just because you cry doesn't mean that you are fragrantly worshiping. It can elicit emotion, but it is not emotional. Understand the difference. Fragrant worship can elicit emotion in your life. And very often it does. But it is not an emotional response. Another characteristic of worship, fragrant worship, is the fact that we cannot out God's ability to love us. Listen to this. After we truly have repented and revealed excuse me, and reveled in God's sure forgiveness, our worship becomes the fragrance of the purest of oil. We who have faced the depths of our depravity may find worship to be a privilege that it really is. The tragedy is the same persons who have the deepest capacity for worship are sometimes those who feel the least able to worship. They feel unworthy. You come into church and you want to sing a song and, and the enemy whispers in your ear, how can you possibly worship the Lord with that same tongue that you, that you cursed out your husband before church? Or you yelled at your kids. You want to have a big fight? Get ready for church. <laughs> how could you possibly come in and lift your hands when this week you were the things that you were doing? Or how, how is it possible that you could come and and kneel before the Lord with all the things that you have said or done. Condemnation, it puts you, pushes you away from the Lord. That's from the enemy. Conviction draws you. Our worship becomes the fragrance of purest oil when we've repented. When we face the depths of our own depravity, we found worship that to be a privilege that it really is. The tragedy of the same person, I mentioned that already. The greatest cause of a believer's inability to offer fragrant worship is the feeling of worthlessness. Your past sins may forfeit respect or position. But after you've truly repented... Past sins cannot invalidate your right to know God and to worship Him. If 
you have feelings of worthlessness, then you need to allow God to lavish his love on you because lavish love leads to lavish worship. Those are the characteristics of fragrant worship. I want to look in John 4.23. I've looked at this scripture in many times. I've actually even shared on it before. But the Lord opened up in a different way for me this time. He says in John 4.23 and in 24, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, my entire life I have loved to worship. As a, thinking back, I, the upright piano that I have in my home actually was from my parents. They let me have it when I got a home a number of years ago. And I used to, I barely even, I still don't, I, mean, I clunk around compared to, to what Laura does, but um, I would sit there and play probably the same three songs over and over, and I just remembering, I, I remember just sitting there prior to service, whether it be on a Wednesday, I led worship back then, I led on Wednesdays, and just like pouring myself out on this piano. I'm surprised it hasn't rusted out, frankly, with all the number of tears that I have I've fallen on it. But I just remember doing that. And so worship has always been a very important thing to me. So this passage right here, I many times have asked the Lord, I want to worship you in spirit and in truth, but I don't really know what that means. What does that fully mean? I want to understand it fully. So let's take a look here. Because it says for us, I want to be considered a true worshiper. How do I do that? Worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It says it twice. So first of all, we have to remember that worship, worshiping God, that He is worthy. So it makes it easy. Because He's worthy of the praise. He's worthy of our worship. So let's look at these words separately so you can kind of see what each of them mean. True means genuine or sincere. Truth means free from pretense, simulation, falsehood, or deceit. You can't truly worship the Lord in a, in from, coming from a deceitful place. You may be able to trick all the people here. You're not tricking the Lord. Truth worship comes from knowing who He is, and if you don't know Him, you can't properly worship worship him but here's the good news how do you get to know him right here we all have the opportunity to find out who he is what his character is so that you can truly worship him in spirit and truth we're a three-part being we've mentioned this on several occasions spirit soul and body our body can sing shout clap raise our hands bow and dance our soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, can give expressions to these things, can give words, can laugh, can cry. None of these things are worshiping as described in John 4 unless they are directed by our spirit man. God is spirit. And if we desire to truly worship him, we need to do it in our spirit. How do you do that? Well, spirit without truth leads to shallow, overly emotional experiences that could be compared to a high. As soon as the emotion is over and the fervor cools, the worship ends. So many times you go to a seminar or kids go to camp or whatever, and, and many times there's this fervor that comes out of it. In many cases, it's very genuine and spirit-led, but the problem is if you don't have the foundation of who he is, who the person is that you're worshiping, it will die off. Yeah. 
Likewise, truth without spirit can result in dry, passionless encounter that is easily led to a form of joyless legalism. The best combination of both aspects of worship results in a joyous appreciation of God informed, appreciation of God informed by Scripture. The, nor, the more we know about God, the more we can appreciate Him. The more we appreciate Him, the deeper our worship. The deeper our worship, the more God is glorified. Watch this. Worshiping in spirit and in truth involves all three parts of who we are. Our spirit man rises up and desires to give an offering or adoration because our mind knows who he is, what he has done, and what he will continue to do. Our emotion gives expression to such knowledge and desire, and our body gives action to all the above. That's worshiping in spirit and in truth. Simply put, it is worshiping with all that we have, with all we know. There are times the Lord had done a work in my life, and and, and coming and worshiping, it was different. And there was an expression of the Lord that I could feel welling up inside of me. There were times that I felt like if I did not release it, my The only way I can describe it to you is my head was going to blow off. Adoration and appreciation for the Lord. That is a knowledge of who He is. Desire coming from the spirit man and then my body allowing the expression to come. I had to do that. Willfully, I had to allow my physical body, to be able to release that expression without worrying about what other people thought, what other people were doing. I may have been the only one. You may be the only one. But you never know by your obedience and your willingness to allow that to work through you what it will do in the house. A release that comes, you expect it from us up here. You expect us to worship lavishly. But imagine the day when we all come with one heart and one mind and one voice that we will give an adoration to the Lord that could not be contained. (laughs) That's right, Declan. It's a volcano of worship. That's the best way I can describe it. That's how I really felt like it was just something that was just coming and it was just stirring within me. And it got to the point where it was just, I had to let it out. And it was, in many cases, very loud. It's a volcano of worship that can't be contained. And the lava of your worship not only touches the throne of God, but also spills on those around you. Mark, I forgot to give you a heads up. Can you have the kids come back? Thank you. Let's be a volcano of worship for our king. Yes. 